Hi, I'm Hallow Virgil the Doubtful, and this is a summary chapter for the poorly animated Book of Mormon. I've read Jacob, woo, Jacob, and four others. I, I don't know why we go through 50-some verses of Nephi 1 and 2, and then Jacob is only seven chapters long, and then there are four books, four books with one chapter each. Enos, Jerom, Omni, and the Words of Mormon. And here's the thing. Enos, Jerom, and Omni could have been combined into one book because Omni doesn't say anything in his book. He says like one verse. And it just then then it's just a lineage. So it might as well have been called the Book of the Kings or Chronicles or something like that. And Words of Mormon is is out of nowhere. But let's start with uh, Jacob, or as I insisted on calling him repeatedly, Jacob. Jacob starts his first chapter with uh, a little bit of history progression. Uh, we find out that Nephi has passed on. Then he launches into a fire and brimstone <laughs> bit of sermon where he says, despite the fact that there are some pearl-clutching, weak-willed, tender, delicate flowers and then Nephite women in present in the audience, he's going to lay the smack down. And the issue that's stuck in Jacob's craw is the menfolk having many wives and girlfriends, the whores and concubines. And Jacob is very insistent that God is all about Adam and Eve and not Adam, Eve, and Betty, and Susan. I don't have any other names that rhyme with Eve. And he specifically points out the problems in the Old Testament where people like David were not particularly faithful and that God is all about this being wrong. So uh, I'm sure that will stick and we'll never see that issue arise in the Mormon church. In the next chapter, uh, Jacob goes on to emphasize the already pretty well-established racism of the Book of Mormon by pointing out that the Lamanites are cursed to be black because of their sins. So there's no way around this. This is the curse of the Lamanites and that those sins are hereditary. Their children will inherit them. So the point of this, I guess, was that the Nephites should not feel so uppity just because they're white and delightsome, because the the current batch of Lamanites are only cursed because their parents were cursed. I don't know how this works. I don't understand it. That said, the Lamanites are at least sticking to, and he's this is cannot overemphasize how much he overemphasizes this, the Lamanites are at least sticking to the one man, one woman concept that God is so insistent on. They are on board with that, and uh, so plus in their column. He then spends a whole chapter, a whole chapter, mind you, bemoaning the lack of space on these plates, uh, covering the already established and well-trod ideas that God rewards those who keep his commandments and punishes those who do not keep his commandments, unless, of course, they're Lamanites, in which case he will reward you with prosperity and so forth, whether or not you keep his commandments. So that's fine. We then get to chapter five. In chapter five of Jacob was the parable of the olive trees. 77, 77 verses in which Jacob recounts the nowhere else known prophet Zenos and his long-winded parable of the olive trees. And the parable is essentially just a reframing of ideas we already heard back in 2 Nephi. The olive trees represent the Jews and the Mormons and God's attempts to send people out to preserve this, his word and to continue, you know, to, to sort of purify his people through culling them, like getting rid of the bad slowly and, and reintroducing the good back in. And that's fine, but we've already covered this and we did not need 77 chapters. Remember the islands, the people of the islands, and God sending people out from Jerusalem time and time and time again, and how there were all these Bibles that were out there? This is just more of that, and it is the most boring thing to read. In my review, I made it a video game because I needed something to entertain myself, and hopefully I entertained you. Chapter 6 of Jacob is just an interpretation of the ludicrously long chapter 5, since we have all this free space, and you know, you might as well get that in there. And then chapter 7 is a weird postscript. Jacob 7 is the story of Sherem, this guy who shows up and insists that Jacob is wrong about the doctrine of Christ. And he challenges Jacob and God to prove him wrong. So God kills him. Dun, dun, dun. He just kills him. He just... I, he, he gets three days of suffering to recant his claim, and then he dies. And that's the story of chapter 7 of Jacob. That's Sherem. He shows up, blows his horn, struck down by God. Lesson to us all. We then move into Enos, and Enos is a moron. He goes out into the wilderness while hunting, and he decides to spend the day praying. And he prays for a wish from God, basically. He eventually gets around to, God grants him a wish. And what does he wish for? What does he wish for? He asks for something he and his people already have. They already have a prom God's promise that the gold plates are going to be kept around, that, that they will survive. But God says you can ask for anything you want. So 
Enos has the opportunity to say, hey, how about my people not get wiped out by their enemies? How about you give us a, a, a way that we don't fall away so often as you've predicted? I mean, something to make the future brighter, not just, you know, slightly less awful. And again, they already had this. Thanks, Enos. Awesome job. Jerem, son of Enos, spends his assigned chapter slandering the Lamanites, who are murderous, blood-drinking, warlike monsters, and the Nephites are industrious. So industrious, they have really charged through the uh, civilization tech tree into areas unheard of in American history. Literally unheard of. As in, they didn't do it. I mean, it, there are swords and bows and horses and just levels of technology that the Native Americans, frankly, never reached. Omni, son of Enos, is a bad man. That's what he writes about himself in the book that bears his name. And that's the only thing he really writes, is that he gets the plates... And he begins a long series of pass-alongs of the plates. So I guess this is the story of the priests. Jacob is obviously the son of Lehi. We knew that. And his Jacob's son is Enos, and Enos' son is Jerom. Jerom's son is Omni, the horrible. And Omni's son is named Amaron. And Amaron gives the plates to his brother, Chemish. And Chemish or gives the plates to his son, Abinadom. And Abinadom gives the plates to Amalekai, his son. And Amalekai tells us a little story. And that story is about Mosiah. And Mosiah apparently leaves the land of Nephi and goes out into the wilderness and stumbles upon the land of Zarahemla, which we've never heard of before. But the people of Zarahemla have been at war with the Lamanites for all time, as far as we can tell. So Mosiah shows up and he is carrying the brass plates and turns out that he uh, teaches the people of Zarahemla his language, no time flat, <laughs> just literally, and then he taught them their language, so that works out. And you find out that the people of Zarahemla left Jerusalem and, or left Judah about the same time that Lehi left Jerusalem, and they all arrive in the New World together, although they've never seen each other and they're fighting the same people. And the people of the land of Zarahemla are so enthusiastic about Mosiah that they make him their king. Because he can read the languages, he has the brass plates, and he can teach them. So I guess he is pretty miraculous. And Mosiah reads this giant rock, which has engravings on it, and the giant rock is telling us about this guy named Coriantumr. And this Coriantumr is from a different group of people who leave at the time of the Tower of Babel. So the Tower of Babel makes it into the Book of Mormon. So Coriantumr comes to the New World, and his people are here somewhere, and I I, I guess they're the ancestors of the Zarahemlites. It's hard to say. It's very confusing. And the last thing we hear about, the last thing we hear about is that uh, the the people of Zarahemla keep trying to find the land of Nephi and they keep getting wiped out, either amongst themselves or they keep getting lost in the wilderness or whatever. We then move on to the Book of Words of Mormon, which is a very confusing book because it should be the first book in the Book of Mormon because it is written by Mormon and his son Moroni. And the story that he's telling is he's leaving the land of Nephi with the plates and he is in, he's going to editorialize them. He's going to put them all together and he's going to assemble this into a single book. And this would make a great framing device if it was the first book. Like, I had to leave the land of Nephi and I have the golden plates and I have... Uh, come to this place to assemble them together, and I'm going to tell you, the reader, what's on these plates and about me leaving and about the Nephites and all this stuff. So you have the sort of end presented at the beginning and then you work your way back to it, uh, which is fine, you know, when you're reading a story that it's framed that way. But in the middle of the story, we go from talking about this King Mosiah and his son Benjamin and the Zarahemlites or whoever they are, and we jump several hundred years into the future to Moroni and Mormon and you, you it's just jarring. Uh, and that's all he says is that I'm going to tell you about King Benjamin. I'm going to tell you about all the things that happened to them. And uh, and that's coming up next, I think, in the next book. So that is Jacob plus four. In fact, that is all. It's disjointed. It's weird. It's four little tiny books that really don't, <laughs> you don't need this information, actually. One of the books out of place, the other three books, uh, it's just retreading old ground. And Jacob is a mishmash of information. Uh, I found this all a really not a particularly great read. The best part about this for me was I got to make a fun couple of backgrounds for my <laughs> for my videos. You know, I made a hell background. I made a cave. Uh, I got to draw the Tower of Babel. That was kind of interesting. It's introduced the land of Zarahemla out of nowhere. Why haven't we heard about these people in the past? What happened to all these other... Who is the... And we, and we don't even know the king of the Nephites is right now. Or if the Nephites are still around. I think they're still around, but I'm not 100% sure. That's from, from reading the next 
book. I think the Nephites are still around in some level, but I'm not sure. And it's, it's even trying to write all this down. It's very confusing. So Jacob plus four, everybody. And I'll see you next time when I start the much more interesting book of Mosiah. I'll see you soon. Hope you enjoyed. And I, as always, am your guide, Virgil.